Coach Phelps, thanks for joining us here in strange remote circumstances in these odd, odd times. And I know we're all supposed to follow guidelines because health and wellness and safety is the most important thing. Well, I appreciate you having me. I know this this time was going on, man, is just kind of difficult, but you know, we as a people will figure things out for sure. No doubt, no doubt. Now, in being healthy and, and in being well, we're, we're remote, but I want to go back in time here. I want to go back to April 5th, 1993. Ooh. L little, little ways back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're making me feel old. <laughs> in the, in the, the famous moment uh, against Chris Weber with the trap. But before that play started, you played a lot of ball. But you've got to know there's a, this is for the national championship. I mean, this is a huge what was your What was it mentally? What was your mental state like? What was it emotionally like? Were you nervous or is it just more ball? Tell you the truth, the, the time I was actually nervous was, was uh, before the game even started. Just the, just the whole thing about playing in a national championship, all the buzz around us of playing against the Fab Five and just being in that moment like, this is what you work for your whole your whole college career to get to this moment of playing a national championship game and have a chance to win a championship. So just before that, but once the ball goes up, it's just basketball. So there's 20 seconds left. Free throws missed. Weber gets the board. First of all, it looked like he may have walked with it. And then what what were you thinking? Because you were on the other side of the court. No, he actually traveled. I don't know. <laughs> it's so funny. Like that. The rep that was actually on that end probably wasn't even looking at all because he probably figured that, why should I look at him? I'm just going to run down the floor and, and miss, miss a big play that could have made it easier for us. For sure. But uh, at the time, I was around mid-half court in, front in, the, in the back court area, and, uh, and George Lynch kind of jumped, jumped the play at the time to not get the ball to Jalen Rose that made him travel. Hmm. So once he can throw it to him and did his travel and they didn't call it, he just started to dribble up the court. I kind of just veered him to the baseline, which, you know, I kind of body him up a little bit. So, you know, he's a big guy. So you had to try to use my little frame to get him to veer him up where I always do, you know, and had to lead him to the corner. And that's when George Lynch comes from behind out of, out of nowhere and just puts him in the trap. Did you know they had no timeouts left? Yes, you know, Dean Smith is one thing about Dean Smith. He always had us inform the situation of everything. What we have a time, what we have in timeouts, what they have. And just, we worked on situations every day in practice, which is crazy. It could be the last three minutes or we down seven with two minutes left. We worked on so many situations during the year. We felt comfortable being up, down, or whatever situation it may be that we felt like we'd be in a good chance to win a game, regardless of what the score was or how much time was left. So he calls timeout. The whistle blows. You kind of knew, like, oh, we got it. You know what? I was kind of shocked that the ref actually allowed him to call the timeout. Like, oh, blew the whistle and called timeout. So I looked at the ref. I turned my head. It's like, okay, he actually signaled timeout. And knowing that they didn't have no timeouts, and that way – and the way how we are as Carolina, how Dean Smith always had us that, oh, the game is not over. So we stay focused in the moment. We ain't going to sit there and celebrate and say, hey, the game is over. No, we still got to make free throws. Still got to get the ball in bounds. Still could be more time left. So we stay focused the whole time. And when it's over, then we celebrate. It sounds like you had an amazing experience with Coach Smith. Oh, 100%. I think. He's, he's one of the men probably that got me the way I am now as a coach. Just a, just on all levels of being focused. Don't let your emotions take, take over you during me coaching. And that's how I was as a player, too. I wasn't, like, so emotional. I'd cheer and, like, clap for some time, but it was all, like, to celebrate my guy for a second. And it's like, all right, back to business, stay in focus. And that's how I kind of treat coaching. I don't jump up and down on the bench. I stay even keel. I think I'm the only coach on the bench that's like, with no emotions. <laughs> I think that's what Coach Smith loves, well, Coach Kyle Smith loves about me, that I'm the one that's even killed, know that I've been there before as a player, 
and I'm staying in the moment till to that whistle, that last second, and it goes zero, 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 zero. That I'm focused till then. And when it's after that, then it's like, hey, cotton fire, hey, congratulations. That's when I'm. That's when I'm more like, okay, I'm involved now. But before that, I'm focused. I'm 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 really focused on the task at hand. How much did you have to grow up? You played at a powerhouse high school program, Christ the King. You played with Khalid Reeves, who played at Arizona in the NBA. So you'd been at the highest of levels of ball since playing in New York City. When you went to Chapel Hill with Dean Smith, how much of an adjustment was that? Or were you already pretty stoic and and prepared because you'd played at such a high level? I think I was pretty prepared because I played with a lot of big time players in high school. So I wasn't like the guy. And I was one of the guys, but I said I wasn't the guy. So I kind of, I could always blend in in any situation. And I think I learned, I learned a lot from probably when I was in junior high school. I had like some tough, hard, no, hard nosed coaches then that got me to who, I, to who I was before I got to high school. High school just took me to another step. Then when I got to college, I was pretty much prepared so I could fit in. And I think when I got to college, I think I kind of just sacrificed myself for the betterment of the team. I think when, I did this, when did this all start for you? Like, you're saying junior high. I mean, how big were you in junior high? When did you know I've got the size and ability? And, and when did this kind of elite basketball path start for you? When I was probably around 10 or 11, I was pretty big. So I was, I was a big guy playing, playing center in the oh, junior right. high school level. So I was like the biggest guys, but the coach always put the ball in my hand. So it wasn't like I was posting up, stuff like that. It was like, I get the rebound, I'll push it. And I, I still, as a New York guy, all New York guys know how to dribble. Because the thing we used to do in, in junior high school, we would play 21, that one against, it could be five of us, and we go at each other and try to score. So you had to learn how to dribble to just to get by guys to get to the rim. And, uh, and I think it just started from there. And then, and it's funny part, my freshman year in high school, I'm like one of the, I was kind of playing small forward a little bit, power forward, because I was still big. I was like 6'2". And coach was like, you're a better ball handler than all these other guards that's smaller than you. We need to put the ball in your hands and let you make plays for others. And that's when it kind of really started me being a point guard more. And four years in high school, I became a point guard, basically. and it just took off from there. Were you always, you're the all-time steals leader in Carolina history, North Carolina history. That, that's a significant, I mean, George Lynch was notorious as a defender in the NBA. You're with him. You're the all-time steals leader with all the guys who have come through there. Was defense always primary for you? I mean, that's got to come in with a certain mentality. 100% because I never did like guys scoring against me. So I always took pride of just like, it's going to be a tough day for a guy. If I'm guarding somebody, it's going to be a tough day for him because I just don't like guys scoring against me. If you're going to score, it's going to be a great shot or a tough shot that you're going to make it over me, and I, and I can live with that. You know, I, I can't just live with you just – I'm not guarding you, just shoot one in my face, and I'm not, I didn't defend you. But if you defend me and you make those stuff in my face, then, then I'll give you credit that you're a good offensive player. So it, I just always just took pride in that. And I think I just started more in high school. I used to watch a guy on varsity when I played freshman ball, a guy named Carlos Easton, and he was a varsity player. And I used to love his stance and defense. He used to always attack guys, pick them 94 feet. And I kind of like liked the way he played. So I kind of took some of his style of play and put it into my, into my game and made me more of like a 94 feet defender, picking up, going for steals. And I just developed a habit of being good at it. And I think the thing with me being a point guard, I always think before it happened. So I'm going to say, what would I do? Where would I pass it? So I kind of jump past the lane thinking, trying to think before the guy makes the play, thinking something I would do and get there before he even think about doing it. So that kind of made me more cerebral of like, I had the knack. Because I'm trying to think before guys think, and I'm already in the passing lane because I know where he's going to go. So that's how I got good at getting steals in that aspect. But I was really good on the ball. So I was a big problem because of my long arms, and my anticipation was very good, and my footwork kind of made me even more of a tenacious and quick and get steals. It's hard to dribble the ball up against me. 
you, you might have sold yourself a little bit short also by not being the guy. I mean, you were one of four McDonald's All-Americans on that Carolina team. You were a top two guard in the country. It was like you and Penny Hardaway were going yeah. back and forth. Yeah, me coming out of Nike Invitational where it all started that I kind of got myself a reputation. You know, I came into my, after my junior season, I was known, but that summer, I kind of made a big name for myself going against all the top players in the country and played pretty well. And I played against Anthony Hardaway and I kind of was, had one of my best games ever because I took it as a competition. I'm like, oh, this guy's the number one point guard. We'll, we'll see today. <laughs> and I, I took kind of pride in it. I think, I think the uh, funny part, like Penny, I think Penny would tell you this too. He's like, they interview him after that, and they ask him who was the best player he ever played against at that time. He was like that kid from New York City. Is <laughs> the toughest guy I ever played against. And like I brought my game in that game that night because I knew who I was going against, and that, and that's when it all started with my reputation. Like that was the be second best point guard in the country at the time. So you have to that, that'll live up to it. <laughs> yeah, well, hey, you won the national champ. You were all the all ACC all time steals leader, national championship at Carolina. I, I think I think you did pretty darn well with it. With, with New York City basketball has a reputation for above all else. You mentioned the ball handling, and there are a lot of incredible ball handlers and guards, specifically Marbury and Kenny Anderson, mm -hmm. you, you Khalid Reeves, all these guys. But toughness comes to mind, right? And you have you taken that throughout your entire career? Yeah, absolutely. You know, when people think of New Yorkers, they think of the gritty, tough, physical guards type guy that's always trying to get to the basket and great ball handlers and just a mindset of point guards, especially in my era, early 90s and, and before us too. And like I, like I said, and I used to go against guys like Kenny Anderson all the time. And just my 90s class of Adrian Autry, Brian Reese, my teammate, Jamal Mashburn was player of the year. So we, we had a group of guys that were t top notch coming out in that era that people still talk about to this day. And, uh, and we all went to high major programs. And, but we used to play against each other all the time in the New York area, which made us competitive and made us want to compete against anybody in, in a high level situation. So that's what made us good because we had an era a pool of guys that were really good that made us better going against each other all the time. Is there any, do you guys stay in touch? Is there like a New York City crew? And like, do you guys still kind of talk? And was there ever a time where there were like, you know, they talk about the, the, the famous secret dream team practice where Jordan right. went after Bert. Did you guys ever have any like New York City games where like, all right, it's this, you know, it's the off season. Guys got back together, played somewhere like Hunter College or somewhere that people didn't really know about. Yeah. Guys used to always come back in the summer and play in these summer programs. Like you said, Hunter College was definitely one of them. Uh, they had them all over the city. So if you got on a team, and you know how New York is, they always got a guy on the mic. Yeah. Hyping everything up. This guy from Carolina going against the Syracuse guard. It, they, they, it's a real big deal. So you always want to, when you do go to those things, you better have your game ready because they'll talk bad about you if you don't show up. <laughs> I, think, I think it it helps the younger people watch us play that make them want to be the where they want to be. And I remember I ran to Stephon Marbury a long time ago, maybe like seven, eight years ago when he was still in the NBA. And he's like, man, I used to watch you play all the time, man. I was like, where did you watch me play? He's like, man, we used to come to Brooklyn and play. He used to be a little kid and he used to sit there and watch guys yeah. like myself. So you, f you feel good about that. And guys like Speedy Claxton that actually went to Christ the King as well, he said, and he's from my neighborhood in East Elmhurst in Queens too. So he said, you was my favorite player. So you would hear these from these young guys that used to look up to us is a big deal. And so, and those dudes take over the, the torch. So they got younger guys watching them. So it's like the New York torch is always going on, but playing wise, we always try to step up and play against each other all the time when we had the opportunity. Coogs love that you're bringing it here. What'd you think of guard play this year? I don't, I don't I, we'll keep you just a couple more minutes and then let you go. But, you know, Isaac Bonton improved through the year, fair to say. CJ Ellaby led the pack in steals this year, steals per game. 
So I, 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 how do you feel like in terms of toughness and guard play and defense, the, the Cougs evolved through the year? I think we, I think our, our play is definitely evolved. I think it was a little shaky at start. Well, and Gervais too. Gervais was all packed, you know, honorable mention defense. Yes, yes. I think it was shaky at start because new coaching staff, you know, different type of players, a lot of players brought in from all over the place. And just the five guys that actually stayed had a feel for each other. And uh, I think guys like Bonton integrated himself pretty well. You know, he, he played him off the, off the ball early on, then we just put the ball in his hand. So it was adjustment for us coaches too, to what we have. And, and fitting CJ in the, the fit guys like Bonton was not always an easy task because, you know, you got two guys that's alphas that want to score all the time. And you had to figure a way towards the end of the season how do you, we can get these guys to play, to play together well for us to be successful. So I give a lot of credit for our guys grinding out each day with us and just follow what we wanted to do. And I think – it made them better towards the end of the year, which I felt like we would have been, I thought we would, were really going to get going in the conference tournament, playing great against Colorado. And of course, with all the circumstances, you know, that ended sooner than we thought. For sure. Hey, thank you for doing this. Be safe, be well, be healthy. I can't, I can't wait to do it in person. <laughs> nah, I appreciate it, man. And just all the cool fans be safe out there, man. And listen to what everybody has to say, man, and stay in. And I think that's the biggest key, man. And I'm in the New York area right now, so I'm definitely staying focused and being in and following what all the rules of all the higher-ups say and, and go from there. Thank you, Coach. Be healthy. See you all soon. Right. Appreciate it, Matt. All right, buddy. All right, thanks a lot. Thank you.